Chapter Eight of the Great Pearl Secret. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson. Chapter Eight Juliet Breaks the Seals. At six forty two, the Duchess of Claremanagh descended from a plebeian taxicab in front of her pretentious home. She had sent away her own car before going to the lawn, and although there was no wrong in her secret, she was weighed down by a sense of guilt as she went to her room. This annoyed her, because did she know that the story about Monsieur Mayon was not a fake? It was quite possible that Pavoya had had the pearls for months, and had only now given them up under cover of Mayon's name, and his messenger on the Britannia. Juliet felt as Emmy west had expected her to feel she hated the pearls whatever the truth was she could take no pleasure in wearing them all the same she would wear them to show curiosity mongers that they were not in lydia pavoya's hands she would wear them this very night she and claire manor were engaged to dine at the van Estens, and he had insisted in the morning that he would be well enough to go now for all she could tell he might have changed his mind and phoned that his cold would keep him at home that excuse should not affect her however if he did not bring or send the pearls to her room simone should take him a note in this juliet would say not that jack had told her but that she supposed the messenger had arrived and she would ask for the pearls to wear at nancy's dinner party ask for them not as a favour but because of the right she had as duchess of claremanagh madame is very late were simone's first words as juliet flung open her bedroom door i began to be anxious Juliet glanced at her wristwatch at a French clock of the mantel. It was true she was late. She had a new gown which there had been no time to try, and dinner was at eight. The girl's nerves, tensely strained all day, began to get out of control. She was jumpy and cross as Simone unfastened the many little hidden hooks and tiny lace buttonholes of the dawn cloud dress simone's hands were cold as ice she complained she hoped simone wasn't sickening for something then it seemed that the quaint grey hat had spoiled her hair which usually remained in perfect order throughout the day it had to be let down and being immensely long and thick would take twenty minutes to arrange never never had simone been so awkward her fingers were all thumbs for a few moments in her need of haste and her nervous agitation juliet forgot the crying question of the pearls for a knock at the door which separated pat's room from hers set every pulse a throb he had come of his own accord the blood rushed to her cheeks and as she turned to the opening door she looked gloriously beautiful her eyes met claremanagh's with a desperate appeal of a loving tortured soul and he was disarmed could you let simone go for a few minutes he asked i should ask to speak to you alone a few seconds ago juliet had been fuming because every instant counted 
but suddenly time ceased to be of importance she didn't care how late she might be for nancy's dinner she didn't care if she were too late to go at all simone who knew that things were not as they should be expected her mistress coldly to refuse the duke she was intensely surprised to be sent away and told not to return for fifteen minutes sensitively jealous the maid resented being sent out of the room for ce traiteur as she mentally called clermana what a different scene there would be between husband and wife if she had portrayed to the duchess the secret of the afternoon to do so would satisfy her love of drama and a pique against the duke but simone knew too well which side her bread was buttered for one thing the duchess would not hear such a tale from a servant even her trusted maid the duke might be sent packing by a, the heiress but so would simone and for another thing there must be no possible suspicion when the whisperer of the inner circle whispered next as to where the whisper had started it would not do for simone to know that lida pavoya had called on the duke of clermanagh in his american wife's absence the instant the french woman was out of the room pat came close to juliet he was dressed for dinner all but coat and waistcoat and juliet adored him thus in his glittering white expanse of evening shirt she had often told him so you were not very kind to me this morning he said looking down at her his face graver than she had ever seen it before this day i may as well tell you i was a good deal hurt and angry too though i haven't deserved too well of you perhaps but to see you as you are now makes me forget everything except that we've been dear lovers and that you're the most beautiful girl on earth my girl you look just as you looked that evening at harridge's a million miles away in old london the night before our wedding when i came in suddenly and you'd been washing your hair do you still hate your poor romeo Giulietta mia or do you feel like forgetting too and beginning all over again i never hated you not for a minute cried juliet i thought you hated me then you were jolly well mistaken said pat they gazed at each other like two fences for a moment then juliet sprang up and held out her arms he clasped her and kissed her hair her face her bare white neck something he held out in his hand out of her sight behind his back out of the floor she started at the sound and he let her go laughing like his old self history repeats he exclaimed do you remember the little box i bought you with its blobby seals well i have another sealed box for you to-night you're to open madame le plus belle chasse pour la plus belle dame the pearls juliet breathed the pearls echoed pat the girl was thrilled how could she have hated the things so angrily an hour ago her whole mood concerning them and concerning life had changed under pat's kisses she was going to love his pearls for his sake and the sake of their own romance why the seals haven't been broken she exclaimed as she took the box no i was determined you and you alone should do the breaking but didn't the messenger insist he did two can play at that game though what about the receipt i should have thought he'd object object is a mild word i convinced him in the end however 
if not that i was right anyhow that i meant to have my own way darling this is a happy moment for me though i didn't expect to be happy to-night break the seals open the box and i shall know by your eyes what you think of its contents with trembling fingers juliet obeyed each seal was so perfect it seemed a shame to shatter the delicate eye in crimson wax laughing she remarked that it was clear no thief had touched the box pat agreed and took from her the waterproof wrapping as she peeled it off within was a wooden box with a sliding lid such as french jewellers use clermanna had bought it himself at mayen's request he exclaimed to juliet and the seal made also by his ring which held the cover in place and had been pressed by his hand in the presence of his friend the super money-lender by jove i'm proud of it he exclaimed it's a work of art i'd forgotten how good it was the best seal i've ever done and i've called myself an expert a genie of the ring it needed a pair of scissors to loosen the wax from the wood then juliet slipped off the lid and looked from the box something wrapped in a handkerchief of fine irish linen you find my monogram on that rag said pat apparently enjoying himself mayan would make me wrap the case with the pearls in something that belonged to me something that couldn't be copied easily by a thief my hair wasn't quite long enough to do up a parcel in and this was the only other thing we could think of while he gaily explained juliet slowly tantalizing herself and wound the linen folds so doing she smelt a faint fragrance of tobacco pat special tobacco which left its odour on all his clothes it had seemed exquisitely exciting to the girl when she was engaged to clare manor and it was more so than ever to-night when they were having this heavenly reconciliation a reconciliation partly due to jack's advice and his defence of the duke but it was odd that the scent should have lasted all three months juliet exclaimed over this to pat but he counted for it by reminding her how closely the handkerchief had been shut up in the box at last she was looking at the jewel case which had once belonged to the loved sick tsarina it was of white velvet creamy now with age and stamped with crowns in gold pathetically and appropriately dimmed the catch was curious and beautiful a big cabochon ruby shaped like a heart juliet pushed it and lifted the satin lid there on the cushion lay the long rope of pearls curled up like a snake with a curious diamond clasp for its head the girl had expected to cry out in amazed admiration at sight of the wonderful thing Clem Manners, you lamb, she had expected to be literally dazzled, but instead she suffered a shock of disappointment. With all the will in the world to be pleased and grateful, she was dumb. She could think of nothing to say, and she tingled with embarrassment under her husband's eyes. Well, darling, he said, after a few seconds of waiting, don't the poor pearls come up to your hopes? Mm oh yes she forced herself to answer aren't they big aren't they blue i never saw any so-called blue pearls so really blue as these all the same you're disappointed pat judged his eyes on her face don't you think by this time i know your tones and your expressions out with it jewel bless you i shan't be hurt i didn't make the pearls you know and you're a spoiled pet of fortune brought up from your babyhood to play with better toys than these could have had pearls as big as plums 
in a rope to your feet if you'd wanted em only your taste was too good what's the matter with these baubles why girl hesitated if i must say what i think you know i'm supposed to be a bit of an expert in my little amateur way it seems to me that these pearls aren't as lustrous as they ought to be perhaps they're sick they may need sea-water or something yet they haven't the symptoms of dying pearls they haven't lost their colour they've got almost too much to look real they're real enough of course they must be and the clasp is charming isn't it an eye made of a blue sapphire set in white diamonds rimmed with tiny black ones an eye like the design of your seal except that this one looks to the right and to the right pat caught the words from her mouth impossible juliet stared but it does you may see for yourself good god there was horror in his voice juliet could not understand this scene began to feel like a queer dream what is the matter she asked give me the thing she handed him the rope he glared at the clasp as if the diamond and sapphire eye were a miniature head of medusa then he turned to her with a dazed expression still in silence you frighten me she faltered you you say your pearls are always cold false ones can be warmish besides the surface feels different and even if the weight is right test these pat said the girl took back the gleaming blue rope and lifted the largest pearls to her lips they are false she gasped after an instant's pause you are sure yes End of chapter 8chapter nine of the great pearl secret this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england the great pearl secret by charles norris williamson chapter nine the eye that looked to the right the two stared at each other in silence and both were pale juliet's mind was confused the pearls false she tried to hammer the words into her brain and understood fully what the thing would mean for her and pat she thought of louis mayen the super money lender who had kept the pearls for months and supposed that clem manor also must be thinking of him what a treacherous horrible man she broke out at last the duke stared almost stupidly if he could be stupid who is treacherous horrible he stammered why your friend mayen of course she explained my poor pat comprehension dawned in claremanagh's eyes oh mayen had nothing to do with this he assured her who else then juliet persisted the purser on the ship who had the box in his safe coming over but he didn't have the seal mayen had it he or his messenger could put that idea out of your head my darling urged claremanagh mayen had the seal it's on the cards that de Facal, his messenger might have stolen it or had an imitation one made uh, but neither of them had the abruptly the duke stopped he had been talking fast and eagerly and he pulled himself up so short that it was as if he stumbled juliet had been examining the quaint clasp of the false pearls which he still had in her hand but that shocked pause brought her eyes to her husband's face it had been pale and strained but now there was a look upon it of physical suffering you thought of the one who did it she cried someone you care for by an intense effort clare manor seemed to withdraw all expression from his face it became dull like a handsome mask 
i wished i had thought of any one he said no such luck juliet had pitied him unselfishly at first for after all the pearls were his not hers and the loss sentimental and material would be very great if the czarina's pearls were gone but his look his changed tone and the cloud that seemed to rise between them like a mist roused her vague resentment she felt as if she had tried to comfort him and he had pushed her away pat she exclaimed sharply it's no use your trying to put me off you have thought who chained the pearls or anyhow of the person who might have done it you've simply got to tell me i have a right to know my dear child he protested you do spring to the wildest conclusions juliet's anger rose the whole thing is wild only wild conclusions are of any use if you don't want me to try and help you i won't but i can't prevent myself from seeing one thing that perhaps you don't see yet if the real thief isn't soon found and this story gets out there will be some horrid gossip about you clem manor flushed scarlet i do see he said at least i see what you're hinting at if i purloin my own pearls and secretly sell them while getting credit at the same time for giving them to my wife i bring off a very neat coup that's what you mean isn't it the thing sounded so crudely villainous when put into words that juliet was ashamed but there was a fierce light in the eyes which until to-day had never looked at her except in love or seeming love juliet would not let her husband fancy for an instant that he had made her flinch yes that's what i mean she answered one's dear friends are capable of any insinuation and even those dearer and nearer than friends pat flung at her oh i realise that i'm the classic target a poor irish peer the poorest of the lot who dares to marry america's richest girl no beastly trick too vile to believe of him of course a blighter like that couldn't have married the girl for love to hear the word spoken even in bitterest sarcasm was like the prick of a knife juliet had pushed them out of her own mind so often that it was the sharpest anguish to have them thrust into it by pat's adored lips if he loved her she could not see how it was possible for him to speak like that in thinking this she pitied herself desperately and forgot her own words which had lashed him to retaliation she forgot too how that very morning her lips had flung this very taunt she had shown him sharply how much her own she considered her fortune her house and everything he shared as her husband it seemed to her that now he was inadvertently confessing rather than sneering at possible accusers juliet defended her own attractions pitifully yet there was nothing pitiful in her look she loomed tall and aggressive and cruelly beautiful with blazing eyes and cheeks a great many men have told me they loved me and that no one could help loving me for myself but i never believed any of them till i met you and then i was a conceited fool to think you could care for me after lida pavoya pat started as if she had boxed his ears and juliet too was surprised she had not meant to say that the thing had said itself for an instant his eyes flamed then their fire died out and left them cold he looked disgusted i told you once that i had never loved mademoiselle pavoya he said one isn't used to having one's word doubted it's rather humiliating to have it happen with one's own wife but putting that aside why not keep to the point why bring up the lady's name when we are discussing quite a different affair the affair of these pearls out of clare manor's coldness a demon was born and flew straight to juliet's heart for an instant she lost all sense of her own love for her husband she hated him and wished to hurt him as much as she could 
because it seemed that he had gone out of his way to hurt her she tingled all over with indignant humiliation it was as if pat had said i happen to be your husband but you are only a commoner with no traditions of fine breeding behind you while i am a man whose ancestors might have had yours for servants no wonder you have no intuitive idea of decent decorum is it a different affair she cried or is it one single affair the affair of lyda pavoya and your pearls again the words had spoken themselves but a flare of enlightenment came with them surely something had made her speak something which knew what she hadn't thought of till this moment that lyda pavoya had taken the pearls how she could possibly have got them if they had ever been in louis mayon's keeping juliet could not see she had them that was clear and the fact would account for pat's sudden breaking off of a sentence he had begun to defend mayon and de Facal, but neither of them had that he had said and stopped short with an awful look on his face the look of seeing something which no one else must be allowed to see what thing was there that mayen and his messenger had not which another person might have had a thing which would make theft possible a person who must be protected at any price juliet could not guess yet what the thing might be but the second guess was all too easy this time the duke showed no sign of surprise therefore he was not surprised he merely looked more disgusted than before which made his lack of love for his wife and his wish to defend the polish dancer more evident to juliet's racked mind when i gave you my word about not loving mademoiselle pavoya i gave it also about the pearls claremanagh said i told you then that she had never had them i can only repeat the statement since you seem to have forgotten i have forgotten nothing cried juliet it's a man's code of honour i suppose to defend a woman no matter how but if that's not so if you don't care enough for lyda pavoya to lie for her to your wife i'd like to know how you'll answer this question do you swear that you don't suspect her of somehow stealing the real pearls and putting imitation ones in their place clermanagh's face changed he had been frankly though coldly furious now he looked stricken i would lie for no one on earth except for you and then only to save your life he said it's an insult from you to me to ask that i should swear such a thing very well then your simple word is enough said juliet give it that you don't think pavoya has the pearls claremanagh was silent his eyes upon her and in that silence short as it was juliet heard a tiny voice speak it whispered the thing pavoya had which the others didn't have was a copy she had a copy of the pearls i could not believe such a thing the duke answered i have known mademoiselle pavoya for years she is a good woman juliet laughed and laughing flung the false pearls on the floor a good woman you have original ideas i've heard a lot of things about her from a lot of people but never that before because only malicious speeches are amusing the other ones a lot of people the lot we know mostly make Phew, sneered juliet i see the whole thing now except how she got the real pearls but this imitation rope she had you can't face me and say she hadn't i'll say nothing more on the subject while you're in this mood returned claremanagh all right if you think prevarication more honourable than lying straight out panted juliet holding down sobs but you won't do her any good with me or yourself either you were scared blue when i said the eye of the class looked to the right instead of to the left like the eye on your seal ring you'd hardly believe it till you had to then the whole thing grew clear to you 
as it's grown for me now this copy existed the class was made the wrong way by mistake or on purpose as soon as i spoke you knew what had happened your first thought as soon as you could think was to save that woman but you shan't save her i do you intend to make a scandal of this beastly business the duke cut her short with violence if you do you will repent it all your life juliet quivered i don't care about my life now she said you spoilt it you couldn't punish me any more than you've punished me already for loving and trusting you so it doesn't matter what i it matters immensely he broke in again you are cruel to yourself to me to a woman who has never injured you when i say that you repent making a scandal i don't mean because i try to punish you my god no you'll repent because you will be doing a great injustice which can't possibly be repaired and at heart when you're true to yourself you are just it's no use your trying to appeal to my sense of justice juliet warned him that's the last thing for you to bring up he looked at her very sadly very strangely it seemed to his wife as if anger were dying out and a great sorrow had taken its place but that was only his cleverness his deadly irish cleverness of course what then do you intend to do he asked once more confusion fogged the girl's brain a desolate confusion like chaos after ordered beauty the end of all joy all loveliness i don't know yet she said dully i shall have to think as juliet spoke fingers tapped lightly on the door simone's fingers no doubt her fifteen minutes of banishment had passed come in juliet spoke mechanically and if she wished to withdraw the words it was too late the french woman opened the door madame la duchesse is ready for me to finish dressing her she asked vaguely it struck juliet that simone's voice was not quite natural she had probably been listening at the keyhole and had heard everything but on second thoughts what did it matter juliet told herself miserably that nothing could be the same as it had been she could not go on after this living with pat as his wife all the world would soon know that there was trouble between them and simone's knowing first of little importance she was only a servant and luckily a loyal and discreet servant as juliet paused a second before speaking claremanagh answered for her the duchess is feeling very tired and as you know i'm not well we've about decided to telephone that we can't go out he said but not quite decided his wife amended i think that if you prefer to stay at home I shall go and make your excuses in person pat showed surprise he had taken it completely for granted that she would not dream of dining at the van estens no he decided after an instant's thought if you are equal to it so am i he's afraid to trust me alone juliet told herself for fear i shall say something very well she said aloud you better hurry up and get ready then we're late as it is pat did not answer without another word or look he went to his room and shut the door between evidently nixon had not been with his master tonight juliet wondered where the man was and with a bitter sense of amusement pictured old nick's emotions if she began a suit for divorce against the duke she had always liked the queer fellow who had been as fine a soldier pat said as he was an indifferent valet had liked him partly because of his thrilled admiration of her deeply as he adored her at present however that love was nothing beside what he felt for the duke 
he made juliet a shade more miserable than before to know that the worshipping nick would soon cease to worship so far she had kept back her tears but they were becoming irrepressible when simone exclaimed oh the wonderful pearls madame la duchesse has let them fall on the floor the current of juliet's thoughts changed instantly and the brimming tears dried at their source the wonderful pearls she repeated with infinite bitterness sure as she was that simone had been at the keyhole with a look of pained astonishment on the woman's face made her wonder if after all simone had heard everything perhaps she had caught parts only of the conversation and had been trying to find out for sure whether she had heard aright juliet had perfect trust in simone so far as discretion was concerned but it was within her estimate of the maid's character that she should eavesdrop people of her class did that sort of thing and thought it no harm it made the drama of their lives simone would keep her knowledge or her suspicion to herself of course until whatever was fated to happen had happened then no doubt she would tell her friends that she'd known all along still juliet suddenly disliked the thought of being pitied even by her maid simone was aware that her mistress had looked forward to getting the pearls it was humiliating that she should have instead a mere string of wax or fish scale beads simone had heard it couldn't be helped if she hadn't however she should remain in ignorance they're not quite as glorious as i expected them to be juliet remarked i suppose it's like that with everything in life but they are very beautiful ventured simone with a privileged air of the old and trusted servant which he put on like a sort of chain armour at times will madame la duchesse wear them to-night juliet was taken aback she had of course intended to wear the tsarina pearls she had told herself that she would do so if only that everyone should see that she not pavoya had them but since discovering the truth about them why it had not occurred to her that she would wear the things rather would she have thrown them into the fire suddenly however she thought she saw the matter from another point of view suppose she did appear wearing the rope to do so would give her time to think and it would be interesting to see pat's face when he caught sight of them oh yes i'll wear the pearls she said you know perfectly well i had this shot blue and silver tissue made on purpose to go with them why shouldn't i wear them simone simone did not answer because she understood that no answer was expected she had overheard something but it was not her fault that she had not overheard all unfortunately for her the room was large and the duke and duchess had stood talking at a good distance from the door the manner of her mistress however filled up several aching gaps in simone's curiosity and putting together what she knew and what she surmised the maid changed her mind as to her own wisest course of conduct she had intended to sacrifice inclination to prudence and say nothing to the duchess about the polish dancer's visit that afternoon now she decided that it would be best to mention it how to work up to the subject was the only doubt on that score left in her mind uh, madame la duchesse is merveilleuse et insolent she cried as she held the rope of big blue beads over juliet's head and let it fall gently upon the swan's down whiteness of the bare neck madame was perfect as a girl now she goes beyond perfection other women are charming the beautiful pole mademoiselle pavoya for instance but juliet darted upon her a piercing angry glance what makes you think or speak of pavoya just now she sharply questions oh i hardly know except that she is of a great beauty and 
in her way of a strange attraction and then also as no doubt togo told madame la duchesse la pavoya called to-day called to-day echoed juliet you don't mean here but yes madame did not madame know i was about to go out with the bulldog being permitted to pass down by the front stairs i saw the lady arrive to be sure she had on a thick embroidered veil through which perhaps many people would not recognize the most famous features but my eyes are sharp and then her figure there are not two such though to my taste that of madame la duchesse is more alluring more human the dancer is a mere sprite i said to myself it must be about the charity performance for the armenians that she is here to consult with my mistress as she thus interpreted her own impressions simone busied herself in getting juliet's ermine cloak which previously she had laid ready on the bed sometimes when the claremanners were going out together in the evening the duke came in and took his wife's coat from simone slipping it in a leisurely and loving way over the white arms as if he never tired of touching the adorable creature who belonged to him but simone did not think he would come to perform that office to-night and besides she wanted an excuse to escape from her mistress's great wide open blue eyes the maid had taken a tactful way of explaining the dancers possible motive for calling because if she dared to accuse the duke by a hint the duchess would be bound to stop her juliet was struck dumb for a moment she would not have thought after what had passed between her and pat that she could be surprised by anything concerning him and pavoya but now she knew that she could be astounded pavoya had called tog had let her in the traitor bribed by claremanna who had sunk low enough even for that still had togo let the woman in it was easy to make sure a pity i was out juliet said i suppose she went away when she heard that no madame she came in replied simone with the innocence of a child i do not know how long she stayed monsieur le duc would tell madame that it was to his study that togo took her oh very well i can ask him what message he left juliet promptly cut short this confidence she had no wish to learn more and her suppression of simone was no triumph of honour over curiosity she felt a sick languid repulsion against the whole subject for she knew the worst now and any further information would be a kind of horrid anticlimax oh pat pat her heart mourned how has my idol fallen and he talked so nobly about never lying that night when the duke and duchess of claremanagh came into their box in time for the second act of rigoletto everyone in the know said look she's got the tsarina pearls at last and claremanagh wondered at her he wondered terribly abysmally why after their scene together and her threats she had worn the abominable things he had wondered about that ever since the ermine cloak removed he had seen the blue beads on her neck at the van estans he ought perhaps to have rejoiced at the sight for she could not wear a rope of it imitation pearls and accuse lyda pavoya of stealing the real ones that would be to punish him less severely than herself yet pat was uneasy as well as unhappy the only thing he understood clearly in all the hideous affair was that he understood juliet not at all he asked himself over and over again a question he could not would not ask her what in god's name she intended to do next all the way home when at length they were again alone together in their brilliantly lit limousine she did not utter one word nor at once look at him she sat quite still pretending to be asleep 
but Claremanagh knew that he was no wider awake than she. A dozen times he longed to speak, but there are some things a man cannot do. She seemed to have barricaded herself behind a transparent wall, through which he could see, not yet touch, her, as if she had been a lovely statuette under a glass case. At the house she sprang past him quickly, without accepting his help to alight, and ran up the two or three marble steps. Clermanagh had his key, but before he could use it, Juliet pressed the electric bell, and Togo appeared. The girl did not look back at her husband, to see whether he meant to follow, and suddenly he did not mean to do so. He hadn't been sure at first what he would do, but he could not bear to have her shut the door of her room upon him, as she surely would. With a gesture he signed to Togo that he was not coming in. The car waited. He said to the chauffeur in the pleasant, courteous tone which won the affection of servants, I shan't want you, thanks. In that mood he could not make use of Juliet's car. He preferred the poor independence of his own feet, even while he laughed at himself, bitterly for so petty a revolt. He walked to the Grumblers, that one of his several clubs at which he was likely to meet a man with whom he had business, business important enough to remember even now. I won't keep the beastly money on me any longer, he thought. The fellow should have it tonight. End of chapter 9「Chapter Number Ten of the Great Pearl Secret」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rahul The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson. Chapter Number Ten the house in a cross-town street. If Simone had not already telephoned to the private office of the Inner Circle's editor, she might have changed her mind about going there that night. She was less superstitious and of harder mental fibre than most Frenchwomen of the South and of her class. But after the quarrel between the Duke and Duchess, something within her shrank from keeping the secret appointment she had made. It was not that she was suddenly conscience-stricken, or that she thought her mistress had suffered enough, without having the skeleton in the cupboard dangle in front of the public. The woman was incapable of any real love, save self-love, but she liked Juliet, and would have inflicted upon her no great gratuitous pain. The pain to be inflicted in this instance, however, as well as other instances in the past, was not gratuitous. Simone would be magnificently paid for inflicting it, and so far as Juliet was concerned, she could earn the reward without a qualm. It was for herself that she hesitated, and she did not quite know why. That was the trouble. If she had known, she could have argued out the two sides of the matter and for and against but it was a vague sort of presentiment she felt that she would somehow be sorry if she gave this story to the paper she served, and it might not be a proper presentiment at all, but only a form of indigestion. She had, she too vividly recalled, taken at luncheon three helpings of lobster salad, a dish which never agreed with her. Besides, she was naturally excited over her part in the events of the day, and that she had telephoned the office. She had camouflaged her message, lest it should be overheard, but what she said would inform the editor that she had up her sleeve the best titbit he had ever gotten from her. Tomorrow afternoon, the inner circle, a weekly publication, would be on sale, and the whisperer's columns were always kept back till the latest possible moment on account of just morsels dropping in. But tonight, the last paragraphs were to be held up expressly for Simone almost beyond the time limit. She was bound to make good, or she would never be trusted again, and if the editor was satisfied she was to receive exactly five times the sum, 
she caught for more or less valuable items supplied each week. With a vague, uneasy presentiment in one scale and five hundred dollars in the other, notes not check, the inner circle never paid checks for whisperer stuff. The presentiment was outweighed. Simone had in any case a dinner engagement with nothing sort of that would have induced her to miss, and the Duchess had not been quiet ten minutes when she flew out to keep it. She said nothing to her dinner companion, however, about the later appointment and excused herself early on the plea that it would be like Madame to flash in at home, clamouring for her maid between Mrs. Van Esten's party and the opera, if only for a minute. Certainly it was more than a minute that Simone remained at the firehouse after being brought back after dinner in a taxi. At the end of that time, she was out again and on her way to the office of the inner circle. About this place there was always something mysterious even to Simone's practical and unimaginative mind and the private office of the editor was the heart of the mystery, the inner circle of the inner circle. For years, she had been a highly paid contributor to the scandalous little paper, ever since she had entered her first smart situation in New York, and had been approved by a man whose outward business was straightforward, reporting for the society columns of the reputable daily. When in town, Simone had been in the habit of calling in person instead of trusting to the post, and since her value had become recognized, she was invariably received by the editor himself in that very private sanctuary of his. Yet to this day, she had never seen his face and did not know his real name. Mr. Jones will speak to you, was the message telephoned down from the regions above to the amateurish little reception room where an elderly mild-faced lady in old-fashioned dress received the visitors and tapped a typewriter but the frenchwoman was sure that outside the office his excellency was other than mr jones as sure as that simone amaranth was at home simonetta amaranti the editor's private office was divided practically into two by means of a fixed screen or partition of match boarding so high that even if an enterprising caller jumped onto a chair, he or she could not see what lay on the other side. There was no door on the screen. Therefore, no danger existed that the editor could be rushed. Against the partition was placed a table and a chair of the ordinary office furniture type, and the other decoration there was none. On the table were writing materials and a small house telephone. By means of this instrument, one spoke to the presence on the other side, and he spoke in return. That it was always the same presence, Simone knew by the voice. It was peculiar, mincing, and rather effeminate. And though she shrewdly attributed this quality to disguise, it could not well have been initiated by an understudy. This happened to be the first time Simone had ever been to the office at night. It was in a cross-town street, within possible walking distance of the firehouse, and this was luck for her, as she would have taken a taxi with great reluctance. This errand of hers was the most ticklish that she had ever carried out, and she could not afford to leave the least detail to chance, in case a hue and cry should be raised by the Clare Manags. Twenty minutes of brisk walk, brought her to the door of what had been once a private house, and was now given up to the offices. The inner circle occupied the two lower floors, and above was a quiet, well-known, though not very fashionable manicurist, Madame Vino. Still higher, the fourth and the top floor was tenanted by a wig-maker, who widely advertised a hair dye golden glints, and once when a wave of rage against the Whisperer swept New York, it was rumoured that both these businesses were secretly owned by the inner circle. No proof was obtainable. However, and since then, several new managers had come and gone, both for Madame Vino and Golden Glints. Tonight, the whole house front looked so darkly brooding to Simone's worried eyes that she 
could have believed anything of it, especially anything that was hideous and evil. There were no lights in the windows and the front door, always open by the day, was closed. But the voice which answered Simone's call on the phone that afternoon had warned her that this would be so and had told her what to do. Following instructions, she descended the steps to a basement door and touched an electric bell above which, on a small brass plate, was the word janitor. Two or three minutes passed and brought no answer, but suddenly, as Simone was about to ring again, the door opened on a chain. What do you want? A woman's voice demanded through the aperture. To see the editor of the inner circle, replied Simone. I have an appointment with him. Oh, what's your name? questioned the voice. Mademoiselle Simone Amarante. The chain fell, and the door opened as if the Frenchwoman challenged had given the countersign. Simone squeezed through the small space allowed her, and the door instantly shut. It was dark in the basement passage except for the light that came from a room at the back. The woman, the janitor's wife, perhaps, had a little knitted shawl over her head, as thought she was suffering from neuralgia. Simone could not see what she was like, whether old or young, except that her silhouette loomed tall and slender against the dim light. Can you find your way up? asked the voice. Yes, said Simone. I was told it would be dark and that I must bring an electric torch, I have brought it. Very well, go up, and knock when you come to the door. Mr. Jones is expecting you. Simone switched on the flame of her torch and went up. End of chapter Recording by Rahul Chapter 11 of The Great Pearl Secret this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Siobhan McAlpin. Chapter 11 In Jack's Private Sitting Room. Next morning, Jack Manners was hideously jerked from sleep before eight by the jangle of a telephone bell close to his bed. In self-defense, he reached out and grabbed the receiver in haste to stop the din. Hello, his voice said, but his tone said, damn. And he was astounded when Juliet answered. Juliet, phoning at this hour? Juliet, who had been at the opera last night, as he happened to know, and who had always loved her beauty sleep, as a young bird loves its nest. I'm so sorry to disturb you, Jack, she was saying. I suppose you were fast asleep. And you'll wish you hadn't told me you were going to stop at the Terrasson. But I can't help it. Do you mind getting up and dressed in a hurry and letting me come round to see you? Shan't I call you at your house instead, Jack suggested, wide awake now. No, I must come to you. Have you a private sitting room? I haven't. Then take one at once and be ready to receive me in it. Will half an hour be too soon for you? Not a bit, Jack assured her. He spoke with the warmth of affection and felt it. But that was all he felt. The reaction he'd been expecting yesterday hadn't come yet. He phoned downstairs that he wanted a private sitting room and breakfast for two with flowers on the table in half an hour. Then he plunged into his bath. And as he shaved and dressed with the haste that knows how not to waste a single step or gesture, this was characteristic of him, he wondered, as he had wondered yesterday, about himself and Juliet. Funny how he had dreaded meeting her married, for fear the boiling lava should break through the cooled crust. And the lava hadn't broken through. He couldn't even feel it boil. Juliet had her old sweetness and charm, even more. She was prettier than ever, too. He still loved her, of course. Only the love didn't hurt like a wound with someone twisting a knife in it as it had hurt when she told him she was engaged, and on the day of her wedding. There was just a gentle, rather interesting pain, like the pain of remembering a beautiful dream which had broken off in the mist, and it was no sharper this morning than when she had came to tea with him yesterday. 
just to test himself he had gone to the opera and stood up because there wasn't a seat to be had in order to have juliet burst upon him in all her glory wearing the pearls and perhaps beating with the recovered happiness at clarinamay's side well she had come late into her box and made a sensation everyone had stared at her and the pearls through leveled glasses she had been just as glorious as he'd expected though she hadn't exactly beamed and he jack had not turned a hair he hardly knew whether to attribute this to his superhuman self-control or the strong moral barrier set up between his thoughts and his love by her marriage anyhow there it was he was enduring no cavalry and his heart played none of the tricks it would have played once at being awakened by juliet's voice with the request for a meeting alone with him all he felt was sympathetic interest and a fear that the girl was coming to say she'd made a hash of things in spite of his advice in precisely twenty-five minutes after the first call of the telephone bell in his ear he was dressed and criticizing the arrangement of la france roses on the table in his new sitting-room sharp on the half hour again came the jangling call lady for you sir says she's your cousin and it's not necessary to give her name you're expecting her quite right manners answered send her up at once i'll meet her at the lift which he did and got rather a shock at seeing juliet in all black even a black veil so i did so i do that's the reason i'm wearing them today the girl almost breathlessly explained i suppose you'll think it's melodramatic of me and maybe it is though i don't feel so i wanted to put on mourning good heavens what for my happiness if she had been less beautiful that announcement certainly would have sounded a melodramatic note or else it would have been funny but she was so white so big-eyed so like a broken lily in her black draperies that jack's heart yearned over her she leaned to him wistfully as they stood just inside the closed door her hands in his and the man knew suddenly that it would be perfectly safe and good for him to take her in his arms he held them out having dropped her hands and the girl flung herself on his breast as she used to do when she was ten if a finger had been cut or a knee bruised the next moment she was crying on his shoulder as though her heart would break her slim young body an incarnate sob as it heaved and shook in his clasp oh jack you're the only one i have in this world now she gasped nonsense nonsense child you've got clarinamé you'll always have him he soothed her this is some passing trouble it will blow over tell me about it but no first you must have breakfast you haven't had a bite or sup i'll bet history repeated itself again his handkerchief was out he wiped her eyes with it he mopped them how long and dark her lashes were wet and clinging together he bent over her and kissed her forehead it was hot and she smelled like a ripe delicious peach but his pulses hardly tingled he was too sorry for her however to analyze his own feelings much or even think of himself although after years the adored one married and belonging to another man was in his arms of course she hadn't had breakfast she said she didn't want breakfast the very idea of it made her sick she had been awake all night and had been dressed without a maid to help her since seven she was just one bunch of raw aching nerves but somehow jack was able to soothe her a little as pat at his best could never have done because she loved him too wildly jack got her to the sofa her back to the door so that the waiter bustling in with breakfast should not see the tear-stained face soon there were cushions behind her shoulders the blinds were pulled half down and there was a cool dewy rose in her hand then when the waiter had gone she was sipping hot coffee with cream in it and on one knee behind the sofa jack was feeding her with bits of toasted and buttered roll in spite of herself juliet felt better she didn't want to feel better but she did 
and she had drunk nearly a cupful of coffee before Jack had let her begin to talk. Having begun, however, she told him everything. It all came out with a rush, and Jack listened in silence. Not once did he interrupt, and, fast as she spoke, she could not control her speech to slowness. She thought that he was judging, classifying each incident, considering how one bore upon another. He did not give away his own secret of yesterday, that he had seen Lyda Pavoya go into the house, and that he had known she must be hidden somewhere in the room while he and D. Fasquel were in Clarnamay's study. There was nothing to be gained by telling the poor girl that. She might even be aggravated by the additional proof against Pavoya into accusing the woman as a thief. And the more he thought, the more inclined he was to advise against an open scandal. "'So you see why I have to put on mourning for my dead happiness,' Juliet finished. "'You said that this was passing trouble, but you can't say that now, can you?' "'Yes, I can and I do,' Jack maintained stoutly. "'For her sake wholly, not for Clarnamay's. He began to believe in his heart that this generous, loving girl had been badly let down between the Duke and the Polish dancer.' Nevertheless, it was still only fair to give Pat, as Juliet called him, benefit of the doubt, just as he had urged yesterday. You say yourself that, uh, judging from his manner where the box was opened, when you spoke about the clasp, Clarname was as surprised as you were about the false pearls being there. Well, yes, of course I don't accuse him of stealing the real ones himself, as he so cruelly pretended I did. "'but he must have had a copy made for Pavoya. "'Probably she thought at first that she had the true pearls, "'and when she found out she'd been tricked, "'she made up her mind to turn the tables on Pat, "'or else she saw a way to humble me, his wife. "'Yes, that must be it. "'I'm glad, glad I wore this horrible imitation rope last night. "'I hardly know why I did it, "'unless it was for a kind of bluff. "'But I see now it was more like inspiration.' If I chose to stick to it that I have the real pearls, she can't get much fun out of wearing them, can she? People will believe me instead of her if it comes to open defiance. It won't come to that from Pavoya, and it oughtn't to from you, I think, said Jack. My theory is rather different from yours. Well, what is it, for heaven's sake? It's rather scrappy as yet. But so far, I should think Pavoya might have been working in a much more subtle way than you suppose. I knew that once, long ago, and again later, there was a plot to steal the pearls. Apparently, both times it got up by Russians. And you know they were royal pearls, given by the Tsarina of his day to Clarnamay's great-great-grandfather. Pavoya's a Pole, I believe, but she may be in Russian pay, or under Bolshevik influence. It certainly looks on circumstantial evidence as if she'd somehow got hold of the pearls, either in Paris through Louis Mayen, unknown to his messenger, or else yesterday by some amazing sleight of hand while she was in Clarnamay's study. If she could have worried out of him the combination of the safe, and if by some excuse she induced him to leave her in the room alone after D. Fiscal delivered up the box, we might assume she came at the time on purpose, perhaps not by Pat's invitation. Uh, she might have managed the job. Well, but that's about as far as my mind has worked so far. Except that Clarname can't be accepted to give the woman away so long as he isn't dead sure she's guilty, or which he hopes against hope that she isn't. He wouldn't accuse her, or have her accused if he could help it, even to save himself from your suspicions, which much make him writhe. Are you standing up for him? Julian asked quickly. No, not especially. But you've done him an injustice in one detail to begin with. He did not have a copy of the Serena Pearls made for Pavoya. He didn't have it made at all. It was done before his day, done by your mother's order. He told me the story in Paris, where the everlasting subject was you, you and the pearls. It seems that the Duchess, your pet's mother, soon after her marriage received an anonymous letter warning her of a plot to steal the Serena pearls. It was signed, A Well-Wisher, and the writing looked foreign, but not ill-spelt or uneducated. There was a hint that the plan was Russian, and the thieves would not be ordinary thieves. 
immediately after the duchess ordered a london jeweler to copy the rope clasp and all when it was ready she had the real thing locked up in the bank the copy was so good that no one except an expert could tell the difference but there had been one mistake the eye of the design in the clasp looked the wrong way to the right instead of the left however hardly anyone knew which way the original eye turned so the mistake didn't matter much and the family didn't trouble to have it rectified uh, that was a long time ago but years after there came another warning and when it was compared to the first the handwriting appeared to be the same this time the letter was addressed to Clarnemé, who had come of age and had lent the pearls to some charitable exhibition russia will try again to get back her own take care the letter said or something like that i've forgotten the precise words pat used and uh, it was signed as before a well-wisher now you see what my mind's working on i do see said juliet of course in a way you make things look better for pat at least he wasn't infatuated enough with the woman to have a copy of those famous pearls actually made for her to wear still he must have given him to her or lent them i suppose so jack admits unless unless what well i know nothing about the lady except what i've heard and that she's a dream of a dancer but right or wrong she has the reputation of being a tigerish young person with her blood up and it's conceivable she may have simply annexed the imitation pearls put them on to see how she looked and refused to disgorge Clarnamay isn't the sort of fellow who would be brutal with a pretty woman. He isn't indeed. But anyhow, he let her keep the things and wear them too, even if she hadn't had the real ones. He receives her at the house when I'm out, when he pretends to be shut up with a cold. It must be arranged that she should come them and Togo bribe to let her in. Oh, it's nearly as bad as it can be, if not quite. Pat doesn't deserve that his mind should be eased as it might have been when he saw that last minute that I was wearing the horrid false beads last night. He'd been in such a state for fear that I'd make a scandal. When he saw the rope on my neck and heard me calmly accepting compliments on it, I suppose he thought, well, that settles that. She can't accuse dear Lida now. But he forgets. I can find proof enough to divorce him without bringing up a question of the pearls at all. "'Is that what you intend to do?' asked Jack. Juliet threw out her hands in a gesture of feverish weariness. "'I don't know what I intend,' she sighed hopelessly. "'I wish I could just die. Then maybe Pat would be sorry.' "'That's what you used to say about your family when you were a kid. "'No doubt Pat would be sorry if you died. "'But wouldn't you be sorry when you divorced him?' "'I don't care whether I'm sorry or not,' cried Juliet. I'm too miserable now to care about how I may feel then. That's the state of mind for jumping out of the frying pan into the fire, said Jack. Listen, my kid, did you come here to ask my advice? Yes, uh, partly, though I wouldn't promise to take it if it was anything I didn't like. But mostly I came for something else. What? To beg you to help me. Helps better than advice. You ought to know I'll help you any way I jolly well can. In any way, she caught him up. Jack was slightly startled, knowing as he did know her. Impulsive, even unscrupulous, if a thing passionately wished for were to be obtained, like all spoiled young women, to whom life has refused nothing. Why not out with it at once, and not beat around the bush, he asked. You've some special thing in your mind. <sighs> But truly, Jack, I hadn't when I came. I was just going to ask for your advice and help, mixed up together. You were to advise me what to do, and then if I wanted to do it, you were to help get it done. I've no one except you to depend on, and you were my only hope, if I have any hope left, of making things somehow work out right in the end. It's you yourself who have given me the real idea, the inspiration, the thing to be done. And if you are the one person on earth who can do it, the question is, will you? Can't suppose a question, Manners said. If the thing is a thing that will really help you. It will, it will, more than anything else. But you might think it's caddish. 
You wouldn't ask me to do it, I'm sure, if it were caddish. Well, you see, I'm a girl, a, a woman. It doesn't seem caddish to me as it might to a man. But Jack, it's to save me. It's the one hope to make life worth living or to know the worst and not wear out my soul in suspense. I can't bear suspense. Neither can I, Jack reminded her. He was sitting beside her on the sofa now, and Juliet seized his hands. The thing is, I want you to get acquainted with Lida Pavoya, she ventured at last, to contrive to be your friend, to win her confidence, even if you must make love to her. Stop at nothing till she's told you the whole secret of the pearls. That secret means everything to me. Wrapped up in it is the secret I care so much for, the secret of Pat's love whether it's hers or mine, and his honor is bound up with it too. Will you do this for me, Jack, or is it too much? Never had Jack Manners thought that he could pull his hands away from Juliet's clinging fingers and push her off almost roughly as she would have held him. But now he did both, before he had realized what he was doing, and even he felt a hot resentment against her, not unlike repulsion. Juliet, whom he had worshipped for years, Juliet, for whom his life would have been a small gift. Before he quite knew what had happened to him, he was standing at the window, staring out. He had not answered, had spoken no word. She ought to understand that no answer was the one safe answer a man could give. Caddish. She had wondered if he would think it caddish. Perhaps women were cats, just naturally. He had heard it say that they didn't know the difference. But Juliet! Standing there with his back to her, he began to gather his wits together to face her attack. She would reproach him with violence. He would try not to be harsh, because she wasn't herself, of course. He would explain that what she had asked wasn't too much. It wasn't a question of quantity, but quality. There were some things a man couldn't do. But she wasn't reproaching him. She was crying. God, he had never heard a woman cry as that girl was crying. Such sobs would tear her soul to pieces. They mustn't go on. They would kill her and him. He went back to her. He knelt on the floor and drew into his arms the shaken figure, abandoned among the cushions. Don't, don't, my dear, my sweet one, he implored, awkwardly smoothing the ruffled gold of her hair. Trust old Jack, I'll do something. I'll find out for you. I don't know how. Goodness knows how. But I'll worm her secret from that Pavoya girl. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Great Pearl Secret This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson. Chapter 12 The Whisperer Stuff. My goodness gracious! gasped natalie landes billy wake up have you seen the whisperer stuff billy woke up it was just after dinner early yet to begin the real evening at the grumblers known to some outsiders as the plunderers club and landes had been killing time with a nap whisperer stuff he repeated in a dazed almost startled way and when billy looked startled he was not at his best some years ago he had been considered handsome a big athletic fellow with wavy auburn hair brushed back from a low forehead reddish bronze skin and big black eyes like those of his sister lady west but the auburn hair had faded and thinned growing far back on the forehead which had now become unnaturally high he was less athletic than he had been because his principal exercise was taken indoors these days and consisted of bridge and poker poker and bridge varied by roulette his splendid muscular development 
was slowly degenerating getting into fat and his large face was all red without the bronze his eyes too had changed and though still big had a goggling prominence that was not attractive this was why he did not when startled look his best the eyes goggled his wife said to herself like a pollywogs and aloud she said to him don't pretend not to know don't pretend not to know what i mean by whisperer stuff i was asleep Landais excused himself mildly you don't need to tell me that by word of mouth natalie shrugged you've been advertising the fact through another organ besides you never can keep awake fifteen minutes after dinner if we are alone together not that it matters what i asked was have you seen the whisperer stuff in this week's inner circle no returned Landais. don't you know i never read the rag i've told you so pretty often everybody tells everybody else that they never read it yet i suppose it sells hundreds of thousand a week my copy's just come in jane brought it and you didn't hear her because you were snoring i thought you might have seen it at the club before you left and not said anything to me and not said anything so as to make me speak first why has the viper got in a dig against us vipers don't dig no thanks to heaven or the other thing there's nothing on us but it's all about someone you're just as much interested in more interested than you are in me anyhow juliet clare manor oh billy sat up straight in his chair though he did not seem to be as intensely excited as his wife had thought he would be does the pig mention her by name the pig does not he might as well though for everybody will know who's meant by jove i wouldn't be juliet to-night i believe you grunted landes but he did not believe her he seldom did and in this instance not at all because he was sure he would give her eyes to ju to be juliet just as sure as that he would give his to be juliet's husband what's the racket this time i'll read you the stuff aloud to you said his wife and began let's whisper that a certain foreign gentleman of title who wanted the prettiest and richest young wives in new york is much to be sympathized with because he has not because he has got a bad cold but he is to be congratulated on the marvellous medicine with which he is able to combat his ailment let's whisper again this medicine is worth its weight in gold only millionaires can afford to take it at home and alone as louis of bavaria used to take wagner's operas we know he was alone because the pretty rich young wife was out full up with engagement for the whole afternoon and we know he is a millionaire oh we know it in such a simple way it's because his wife is a millionairess see the whisperer thought you would and now for the medicine that needs another whisper Shh. we spell it with a capital m because it has been a royal medicine since salome the daughter of herodias administered it to king herod dancing is a fine art and its greatest exponent at present in our city is fair enough to cure any king to say nothing of the lesser nobility even if she did not dance for him but of course the whisperer is sure she did dance because with what other motive should she pay a call of consolation upon a nobleman with a cold when his wife was not at home to nurse him can you think of any let's whisper that blade is very becoming to tall slender ladies with white skin and copper hair even when they wear thick veils nothing suits them better unless it's pale blue and blue pearls but ladies with golden hair have now taken to appearing in blue pearls 
ropes of them the whisperer supposes they are real why certainly could they be otherwise yet on the other hand are there two such ropes in the world we shall see we may see any day now and the whisperer hopes and prays that if we do see there won't be trouble but the ladies are so charming pearls are so compromising and the gentleman is so popular let's whisper what a game of consequences there mrs landay is finished with a gasp what do you think of that can you beat it her husband answered with a question i can't said natalie but i guess the duke will beat something or someone he'll have to you mean the whisperer hm. before you cook your hair you've got to catch him a whole lot of men have tried to catch that one but the inner circle still circulates natalie brooded for a moment when she was a girl in a set that was conspicuous though not first rate the whisperer had whispered several nasty things about her he she or it had said that she had come from peoria or somewhere to new york to buy a husband and had kindly warned her that persons not rich enough to pick and choose their goods had better snap up what they could get the first day of the sale at the cheap bargain counter since she had taken that advice and snapped up billy landay's the whisperer had for some reason been silent but natalie had never forgiven or forgotten the attack on her attractions and she had always burned to have some other victim arraigned for justifiable homicide i bet clare manor will break the vicious circle she said and i bet he won't why should he bring off a stunt none of us ever brought they say there's nothing to break some husband or father goes murder mad bursts into the circle office and finds no one on the premises but a little old lady can he bash that besides why make a cap fit you by wearing it the world knows what that d d whisperer is working up to when he hints at the clare manor pearls being false but if they are the duke must have sold them himself and had a copy made two copies perhaps by george i shouldn't wonder if that's just what he did do sell i mean juliet told my sister emmy that clare manor refused the million or so she wanted to settle on him and intended to join the working classes over here he doesn't get a salary to be proud of at the fair bank i know for a fact but i've seen him playing poker at the grumblers and uh another game elsewhere last night he walks into the grumblers after the opera and i happened to see him pass a roll of yellow backs as big as my fist into a man's hand the other chap dropped the lot by accident and the noble duke stood still with his nose in the air while they were collected i saw a one thousand dollar bill with my own eyes and i have a hunch there were a heap more of the same sort who was the man natalie asked curiously i've forgotten his name billy evaded her there are a lot of new men in the club lately i know only by sight tell that to the marine she scoffed you've got some reason for keeping his name dark did any one else see clare manor pay him the money because if they did i'll be sure to find out i think everyone was pretty busy just then i wouldn't have seen if i hadn't been cutting out of a game at the moment it's nothing to me who the man was you're always so damn suspicious of anything i say natalie shrugged her shoulders a favourite gesture but not of what you do i don't care enough she retaliated and picked up the inner circle again to re-read the whisperer stuff while she richly pictured juliet's feelings she didn't know the duchess very well but she thought that there would be ructions pavoya must have been at the house while juliet was lunching with me she told herself i shouldn't wonder if the duke had sold his pearls 
won't juliet be wild if she finds out the wonderful rope everyone was talking about last night was false natalie grew so absorbed in the settling just what she would write to emmy west that she did not even speak to billy when he went out she was sure he was going to the plunderers and she was right nevertheless she had made one mistake about him he had told the truth in saying that he did not know the name of the man to whom clare manor had handed a roll of notes he did however wish to know and as soon as possible but he arrived to find every one talking of the whisperer stuff in the inner circle most of the men were defending the duke who had an extraordinary way of making himself liked without trying and this vexed landays he had a grudge against clare manor for marrying juliet fair the only girl who had ever given him a heartache losing her and getting natalie had made him the man he was what i want to find out is who is the chap clare manor paid about a hundred thousand dollars to last night here in this club he said a hundred thousand dollars somebody echoed how do you know i do know landes persisted provocatively and made up his mind to stick to the statement i do know and what i'd like to know also in the circumstances is how did he get the money ask the winds laughed the other easier to ask his wife you believe she knows no not how he got the stuff but i guess she thinks she knows which is just as interesting juliet was utterly indifferent that night as to whether or not her thoughts were interesting to outsiders pat and herself filled the world for her there was no one else not even jack manners who existed for her after she had read the whisperer except lida pavoya but the polish dancer was not for juliet a fellow-being she was a lure light a mermaid a siren simone was in the habit of buying the inner circle for the duchess on the day of publication she had never been ordered to do this but her mistress in the last place she had filled in new york had expected the rag to appear in her boudoir as soon as it was on sale and simone with a certain cynical enjoyment had unobtrusively supplied the paper to juliet without being asked it was a disgrace to new york and utterly disgusting and unreliable of course and juliet scorned it as a horrid beast all the same she read it every week before flinging it on the floor or pitching it into the waste paper basket and sometimes she was angry at its nasty digs at people she knew sometimes she chuckled one had to and a car took her home from jack manners's hotel as her car took her home from jack manners's hotel she suddenly remembered that it was in a circle day could that fiend of a whisperer have got hold of anything new about pat and pavoya juliet could not see that this was possible but there was almost sure to be some mention of the blue pearl she had worn at the opera unless the news had been too late for press she was so miserable already that she wondered at herself for feeling so small a prick in the midst of a deep and all-pervading pain yet she was conscious of an uneasiness and it remained in the back of her mind throughout the day she had not expected to see pat at luncheon and if she had seen him she would have suffered disappointment whether he were merely resentful against her for the things she had said to him or whether he were ashamed to face her because he had lied and she knew it juliet could not tell in his absence he was as vitally present as if she saw him before her eyes indeed she did see him with lida pavoya it seemed certain that he must have gone to lida if only to demand some explanation of what had happened to the pearls and it was conceivable that if he were convinced she had robbed him he might have a reaction of feeling against the woman in such a case he would perhaps return and implore his wife to forgive him as she thought this juliet hardened her heart against his charm his magnetism which she knew to be almost irresistible she would resist it it would be ridiculous to let herself be cajoled by pat's irish ways he would laugh in his sleeve 
if he could persuade her that he had never loved pavoya but the day wore on and he did not come home all she knew about him was that he must have spent some late part of the night in the house because simone had casually mentioned an early meeting in the hall as he went out about nine in the morning he had handed the maid a few letters which he said were for the duchess to read and attend to rather than for him that was all and though juliet did not mean to pardon him she would have given him the price of the lost pearls to be begged for her forgiveness now and then like a faint undertone in wild music returned the thought of the inner circle and at the time when it should be lying on a certain table in her boudoir juliet looked for it the paper was not there she had come in from her bedroom a wrapper thrown over her nightgown where she was pretending to have a headache and had gone to bed on returning from the tarascon as an excuse for throwing over all engagements there's something horrid about pat or me in the rag she guessed instantly simone's read or heard about it and means to forget the paper it would not be pleasant to ask but after all simone was only a servant juliet bell juliet rang the bell communicating with her maid's room and soon the neat figure in black presented itself and madame la duchesse has run where is that horrid inner circle the duchess inquired simone looked self-conscious she said that madame being souffrante she had forgotten to buy the paper it was of so little importance but juliet would not be put off the french woman was sent out to get the inner circle and when she had got it was told that she would be needed no more for the moment therefore claire manor's wife was alone when she read the whisperer's insinuations strangely enough or was it strange her anger turned in a torrent flood against the man who ran the rack none was left for pat juliet burned for him to come home so that she could even if on official terms only join together in scotching this scandal she felt that she must see her husband at once but she could not send for him without being misunderstood if she were able to reach him by phoning to one of his clubs he would think that he was being called back to a scene of reconciliation because his wife was too much in love to live without him for more than a day no even though her rage was too concentrated in another direction to blaze upon pat she didn't wish him to think that he was forgiven again jack manners seemed her best hope and she phoned him at the tarascon he was out the answer came and juliet asked that the duchess of claremanagh should be called up as soon as he came in an hour later the bell of her telephone jingled jack had returned to his suite at the tarascon i thought you'd never come she complained but he excused himself you gave me a mission i've been doing my best to pave the way you mean you've met pavoya not yet but i shall meet her to-night she's dancing you know or why should you know an old friend of mine and hers too has arranged an introduction that's the only news i have for you so far i didn't ring you up to ask for news said his cousin though her quick brain caught at a welcome deduction if jack were to meet pavoya at a party or something it did not look as if pat had pardoned her for the pearls otherwise they would be together i want you to see pat for me juliet went on not to make it up when you find him tell him that that to begin with please but he and i must meet and talk over this horrible whisperer business i don't want a scandal anyhow that kind any more than he does tell him it's cowardly to run away and stay away like this it makes things worse tell him he must come home or bring him i can't put things to pat in that way but i'll see him if you wish answered jack where is he i don't know juliet's voice sounded disconsolate and very young even through the phone at some club i suppose do call me when you found him it was seven o'clock after three more hours of suspense 
Juliet rushed to the phone at first sound of the bell. If it were not Jack or Pat, she should scream. But it was Jack. I can't find Claremanagh anywhere or hear of his movements since two o'clock, Madness said. He was then at a club you probably never heard of. It's called The Joint. All sorts of men belong. Actors, writers, lawyers, sportsmen, and at least one private detective. Pat isn't a member. I should have thought of the place if a man I know, the one who will introduce me to Mademoiselle Pavoya, had mentioned seeing Pat there this morning with two men. That's why I went round. After I tried everywhere else. Well, he was there at five with the detective I spoke of just now and a Frenchman named de Facal. That name will strike you. He had an appointment to come back and dine with de Facal, who, it seems, came with an introduction and has been made a foreign member. In fact, he's staying at the club, and I have been talking with him. In the hope of seeing Pat at eight, I waited because de Facal was so sure he would come, but at half past nine he hadn't turned up phoned everywhere i can think of since and left word that i'm to be called whenever there's news no matter what time when i go out as i must do if i'm to meet this lady i shall leave my address with the tarascon people what can have happened to pat manners heard julia cry don't worry he's certain to be all right jack assured her but he wasn't quite comfortable upon that point himself and he quietly phoned all the hospitals. It looked queer that Claire Manor hadn't kept that engagement with De Facal. He had apparently been anxious to keep it. If there had been an accident to a man so well known, surely the news would have got into the evening papers. Yet there was no news anywhere of any kind, since the Duke had walked out of the joint at five. Were such a thing not too absurdly far-fetched, jack would have asked himself if any one existed who might wish claremanagh to disappear End of chapter twelve